Hi, everyone. I'm Henry DeVries, CEO of Indie Books International. Welcome to this month's Marketing with a Book and Speech call. It's a Q&A. We have an author here to talk about her journey. And then our author, Devin, uh, our associate editor in charge of production and promotion of books, and then uh, myself, we're available for any question you want to ask about planning a book, writing a book, publishing a book, promoting a book. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome our guest, uh, Dr. Ann Bowers Evangelista. Ann, how are you today? I am doing great, Henry. Thank you. How are you? Super good now that we've published The Endurance Leader, uh, that your book is out there and uh, in the world. Yay. And uh, let's just spend a few minutes to set it up for everybody. Um, why did you write this book? It's, it's really an interesting question because I had never intended to write a book, but the book kind of came to me and said it needed to be written. Um, I have been an endurance athlete for a couple of decades and also a leadership consultant for that same amount of time. And the relationship between these two concepts kept kind of emerging when I would have conversations with leaders and hear about their struggles and their needs to feel like they were sprinting all the time and realizing that some very successful leaders I knew were using some of the same concepts that I was seeing in really successful endurance athletes. And I thought, there's something here, you know, and I want to see if I can figure what that what out what that is. And so um, I started outlining a model that made sense to me. And that's how the book started to take shape. So you're an interesting cross section of triathlete and psychologist. Is that is that true? Yes, that is true. <laughs> well, let's talk about who this book is for. Yeah. You wrote it for a certain group of people. Who who are they? <laughs> I did. Um, and I think sometimes it's I'm gonna start actually by defining who it's not for, which is just really people who are super excited about sports and endurance sports, because that may be some of the people that read this book, but it's not who it's geared for. It's really geared for everyday leaders, and in particular for leaders who are want to redefine what leadership success looks like for them, and also for decision makers and businesses who also realize that redefining success could have great business value. So what's the main message of the book? You know, the main message is really that leveraging a long-term leadership mindset and set of principles can help people build a more lasting approach to their leadership, which is going to create greater satisfaction for them, greater productivity in their business, and greater engagement over time. So that's the models, the examples, the exercises are really all geared to people figuring out what that means for themselves. We like to say here that the book is the number one marketing tool and that speaking about the book is the number one business development strategy. So um, talk about uh, your work and how much paid speaking you do and training that you do and consulting that you do. Uh, what does your world look like, Anne? Yeah, so my world has existed primarily as a consultant and coach for the past 25 years. So that's really the majority of what I have been doing with some opportunities to speak within that ecosystem, often speaking to audiences that I might already know that I've done consulting work for or coached a leader. So usually smaller engagements, very specifically focused on an area around some sort of leadership development. But what the book is really opening up to is new opportunities to speak to broader audiences uh, that really are 
thinking about how do we want to approach leadership into the future, which is a very big topic right now because our world is changing quite quickly and how leaders are <clears throat> positioning themselves is becoming very important to organizations for um, building stronger ROI, building you know, sustainable talent bases over time. So the book has been the way for me to start getting engaged around audiences. So my, my business is shifting to kind of 100% consulting and coaching to um, probably about 30% speaking. My hope is that it will be an even greater percentage as the book gets more traction. So it is definitely, and I will give all credit to the Indie Books team for helping me understand that relationship because I didn't, I really didn't know a whole lot about it before I started writing the book and got connected with you all. Well, well, thank you for those kind words. Um, let me talk to the audience here and, and set some things up. Um, we work principally with agency owners of advertising, marketing agencies, digital marketing agencies, and high-end management consultants find us, professionals find us. And one of our sayings is publishing the book is the starting line, uh, not the finish line. So we're also using that running metaphor there. And um, it is a marathon. Um, some things about impact and influence to share. So um, in addition to these agency owners and consultants, we work a lot in what we call the health authority space. And Anne, we would put you in that. Uh, you're a you know, PhD a psychologist. You're applying these uh, psychological principles to a business world. Uh, that's about mental health, um, not about people being broken so much though there are plenty of broken people out there. Um, it's about maximizing uh, your effectiveness as a leader and um, understanding uh, what makes people tick. Um, I would say about uh, you and I, the type of scientists that we are, um, we can't explain electricity or stem cells, but we know what makes people tick. I, I come out of the social sciences and understanding what makes people tick um, is very useful for all of us. And understanding human relations and the changing human relations and all this. So um, this is what you bring to it. Now, the combination here that Anne's working on is what we all need to work on to be an authority. Um, one, she studied in her field, and earned a PhD. It's great. That alone will not attract what you want to attract. Um, Two, author of a book. So uh, not a crummy, you know, self-published book, but a real book with editors and, and designers and people behind it in the industry. Okay, that's two. Those two won't solve it. It needs a third piece, and that is video, getting on video. So this is one opportunity we have for authors. We also have our TV show, um, Anne spoke at our uh, recent forum. Uh, she's invited to come back and speak at uh, future forums. And we create videos from that. The trifecta is the expertise. The You're an author of a quality book. And there's good video of you talking to audiences about it. Um, so that is what people <laughs> need to book you as a keynote speaker, as a workshop leader. And I'm not saying you can't get booked without those, but the real success we've seen and what we teach people about is it's this trifecta that you've got going on. And an expert and authority with a book and video to back it up can command five to $10,000 for an engagement. So I, I make five to $10,000 when I'm doing a, a paid gig because I have those things going on. We teach our authors to do that. Some of them we've taken up to fifteen thousand dollars, and you know for their presentation. But they they have to build stature. You have to gain a following, a platform, if you will, because 
the more money that people will pay you for those events is because not because of the quality of your speaking or your thoughts, not even if you can do the uh, the the four bagger, which we call make people think, make people feel, make people feel noble, and uh, make people laugh. If you can do those things, great. Um, but they want some impact and influence, prestige that you have. So that if they book you, it'll help people attend their meetings um, or get a lot out of it if you're doing the corporate inside. So, Anne, I salute you for working on all those things. I think you're a good role model for that. As I said, we wanted to open up to uh, questions uh, from anybody today about uh, planning a book, preparing a book, publishing a book and promoting a book. So um, is there any question from the from the field that we have here? Uh, Fran, go ahead. Um, thank you, Henry. Hello, Devin, and hello, Anne. Um, you mentioned, Anne, that it's about long-term leadership. But what I was wondering, did you mean long-term in terms of the career of the leader and the development of the person, or did you mean long-term in the impact of the organization or both? Great question, Fran. Um, the, in the book, I outline at the very beginning that the book is about leading self. So when I think about layers of leadership, leading self, leading others, leading the organization, leading the enterprise. So this is really solely focused on the leading self element. So it is oriented toward how can I as a leader build a sustainable leadership practice that will be engaging for me? It isn't for the organization per se, although my hope would be that they would have downstream implications for an organization that the leader continues to be productive. But because so many leaders end up feeling burned out or not supported and they're disengaged, then we see, we've seen lots of good talent leave. So if people, especially if they get the support within the organization for mindsets and strategies like we have here, from within the organization, I think it builds engagement. But to answer your question, it is built for the for the leader. Uh, may, may I ask a follow-on question? Sure. Um, I hadn't really thought about leading self. And I'm thinking of, for me, the simple leading self thing is sometimes, this is not really where I am right now, but I'm thinking of leading self by saying, we're gonna get out of bed this morning, Fran. <laughs> Absolutely. We're, we're going to do a few things for our health and we're going to take care of a few things. And I'm just thinking, I love that concept. So thank you, Anne. You're welcome. Yeah. More more about that exact concept in the book. So yeah. Great. I, I saw a YouTube video with a, um, a comic and she was talking about when you're young, um, you can give yourself pep talks. You know, you, you're it in the mirror. You know, you can do this. You've got this. And now, now when you're getting older, you kind of get up in the morning, you lean into that mirror and you say, you can do this because you have no other options. You have no other choices in life. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, all, um, all leadership begins with self-leadership, doesn't it, Anne? Yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, if you are... My my point in the book is that if it's not, then you're relying on a lot of other systems to help you build your sense of leadership, which is misguided at best and disastrous at worst, because we don't know. It's like you're always singing to the tune in somebody else's head. So we got to know say, what our Say own. that again. It was catchy. Uh, <laughs> um, if you're relying on your leadership coming from others, it's going to be misguided at best and disastrous at worst. I, I think you that's a good one. And I loved the you're singing to the tune in someone else's head. I loved that. Yeah. I, I mean, our tunes might not always be the best ones, but at least they're our own. So you're quotable, um, <laughs> which leads me to a thought. Um, one of the things we like our authors to do is come up with an advanced list of sound bites and quotable things to say. Um, I have a list of 50 and you, <laughs> Anne makes fun of one of them that I do. Um, when I, I say, love it. You know, we're, we're not monsters. Life. You know, we ask you to do something. We're not monsters. Um, but other ones like the book is the starting line, not the finish line. And 
um, number one marketing tool is a book. Number one biz dev strategy is speaking about the book. Um, I used one the other day that um, an expert without a book is like a movie theater without a marquee. You don't know what's going on. So um, don't rely on yourself to do those in spur of the moment. Um, so I, I co-authored a book um, on closing America's job gap. It came out uh, during the, the Great Recession. And I went to get training on how to be a better spokesperson. So I went to uh, Patricia Fripp. She had a two-day workshop in Las Vegas. And I go there and I'm kind of putting my books down, you know, setting my coffee down. And Patricia Fripp, I don't know if you know her, but she's the first woman president of the National Speakers Association, just this, this legend in the field. She walks right into my bubble, you know, the three feet around you. Didn't touch me, but got into my bubble. She's, she's only yay high. So she's looking up at me and she goes, Henry, it's the most important interview you're ever going to have. What is the main message of your book? And I said, uh, uh, the main message. <laughs> it's like wrong. You know? So I ask all the authors, I do this. We prepare people in the class because you're going to be doing interviews like this. And I fed Anne some of the questions yesterday just to help her get prepared because you should prepare um, for the, so fast forward, the book comes out. I have these pasted on the wall in front of my desk. I had a desk that faced a wall. Uh, and, you know, great. So I put some, I put these up there and I get a phone call one day from a real newspaper, from a real newspaper reporter. And they said, uh, we want to do this story on this, uh, book closing america's job gap do you have just a couple of minutes to answer some questions uh well yes go ahead what's the main message of your book i said the main message of my book is despite the fact that we are in the worst recession since the great depression there are more than 3 million jobs in America that businesses cannot find a qualified person to fill. That's more job openings than the population of Iowa. <laughs> Reporter goes, wait a minute. <laughs> and kept asking me questions and I just looked on the list and kept giving soundbite answers. I do it with podcasts too. Um, after a while, it becomes second nature, but... Um, one of our authors was um, from Texas, and he had a good sense of humor, and he was from Texas. He was a former Air Force colonel in charge of an $8 billion program, and his book was on leadership. Um, and uh, I can't remember the exact one, but I, I helped him. I punched up these. I helped him write them. Um, so, well, if, you know, there was something about leadership, and he said what he said, and then said, Back in Texas, if somebody said that, we'd say, well, bless their heart. <laughs> I trained one CEO who um, sold athletic shoes and uh, running shoes called Roadrunner Sports. And when I interviewed him, I said, how many shoes do you sell a year? He said, 500,000 pairs. I said, I'm going to give you a new answer. Because every interview I arrange, they're going to ask you that question. And here's your answer. Well, how many shoes do you sell a year? We sell 1 million shoes, 500,000 right and 500,000 left. That was it. So repartee, uh, it helps if you're prepared for it and you have some of these. So, Anne, you've said some ones that if you don't have those written down, Write them down and practice them and say them a little slower <laughs> because we're hearing them for the first time. What was the what was the other one, Fran, you said about the thing about her head? What did you say? She said, uh, if you if you're not providing your own leadership, you're singing, you're you're working from the, a song in 
Somebody else's song in your dancing, head. There you're we dancing go. to the tune in someone else's head. There you're we dancing go. With, okay. Now, Anne, you need to put that into all your interviews. You need to put <laughs> that into your articles and blogs. Um, I use that that list I talked about and I'm putting there. So my long-term objective, the long con, the long play here, the long game, is I want people to quote me in writing. As Henry DeVries says, oh, the one I get quoted on the most right now is, if someone asks you a good question, pause three seconds for dignity, and then say, thank you for asking. So I get quoted on that. You know, what will it be for you? Because real authorities and experts get quoted. Antonio, what will the sound bites be and it won't be just because it was in the book once. Patricia Fripp shared with me recently um, somebody very famous, like Richard Branson quoted her in an interview. <laughs> she was like, that's when I know, you know, it really, the strategy had worked, being quotable. Uh, Fran? So, Anne, when I was a kid, I was, a little on the obsessive side and I would um, ride my bike 50 miles with not a fancy bike or anything. And um, I, I can understand a little bit about endurance sports, not that I'm engaged in them now or ever was formally. Uh, but one time I took care of an elderly woman who had Parkinson's and she had never worked out. She had never applied her will to something that I would say more long-term. And so she literally could not do anything on her own to deal with her illness. And have you seen that difference where somebody who has even done a little bit of some form of endurance, I, I don't care what it is, and someone who hasn't and how the difference in their ability to have the concepts and act on the concepts. Gosh, what a what a great question, Fran. I um, it's like so deep and complex around how, who how we construct our identities. Like I feel like we could have a whole separate conversation on that. Um, it's interesting. Another like quotable quote is what from the book that's actually from a, a research article on um, is that most midlife crises are actually a crisis of mission. Like people don't know what their own mission is in the world. And I, when I think about what you're talking about is that oftentimes I think those crises we might see at different points in our developmental trajectory through life um, really have to do with how we define our, our own identity, right? And how much we can really see ourselves as the agents of our own future. And so I don't think it necessarily has to lead to a long-term success, but when the more, in fact, the whole first part of the book is about identifying your mission and what you're kind of on the planet to do, right? So when people are connected with that regularly, I think it, uh, it helps both ground them in their own identity, but it also provides um, that kind of gravitational pull towards something, something more than what's going on at this moment. And when you don't have that, when it's all about kind of what's in the now, I think it's very difficult to develop a sense of like a reward system that's consistent because you're always looking at extrinsic rewards, extrinsic motivators rather than things that are inside. And it sounds like that might be the case. With and, and may I follow on that? As far as I'm concerned, please do. Um, <laughs> Henry's show. So... This is something that bothers me because I've worked my whole life to be in the now. I am a meditator. I have done spiritual study. I've studied with teachers and healers. And there's this, what you just said uncovers a particular dilemma, which is how do you be in the now while having some kind of larger context for the now? And, and how do you, I mean, I, that's what I'm doing is navigating between those two poles. Mm -hmm. And I think you can't live without both poles, but Great. I just wonder what you think about that. 
To totally agreed. I'm, um, <clears throat> in my spare time, I'm getting a certification in sports and performance psychology because I don't have enough going on. Um, but when you think about like athletes that have been successful over decades, like a Tiger Woods or a LeBron James, right? He's an endurance athlete, even though his sport is temporal and in the moment. But these are people who absolutely believe in meditative skills, very, but are also very long term in the thinking. And it's how do you balance that kind of um, ten healthy tension between those two, having that long term purpose that's out there, but also recognizing that your performance really relies on you being present in the moment. If you know anything about the concept of flow, like that's all about being present in the moment. That's what, you know, athletes, when they're at their best, they're in those flow moments and they're just in it. So I totally agree. It's both, but it's really, um, it's that, like you have to figure out what that balance is for every person. And that's why I think that just some of the concepts will help discover some of that. And I do talk about practices like meditation and um, reflection, a lot of reflection work. So yeah, you're on. You're okay, right. I can't wait to get your book. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank so, you. Um, you can get it for ninety nine cents, Fran. Yeah. Oh, I think our sales oh, over. Can. Our sale yeah. is over. Our Kindle is nine nine bucks, but yes, it's nine dollars on Kindle. What about paper? Actual paper? I like paper books. We have paper books. They are available. twenty dollars um, for nineteen. For you, twenty dollars. <laughs> Endurance leader. Okay, thank you. Endurance leader. Yeah. Hey, um, so, Anne, a couple yes. of comments here. One is um, Jeff Foley, who I just introduced you to, we're working on um, another book called Brave Coaching Leadership. And then there's another coaching book that he wants to do. And he says, I know you and Ken Blanchard have told me we should... Um, we should, uh, you know, co-author a book, but I don't know who I could co-author a book with on this. So maybe you two should have a conversation. Maybe so. Um, interesting. For that future book. Um, because an authority is not one and done with a book. They don't have, they don't say everything they have to say in one book, they can't. So I've done 17. Um, I, I wanted to give a factoid to Fran on her comment about uh, Parkinson's and um, this connection. Cause my wife helped, uh, she's a caregiver, caregiver, caregiver and helped Parkinson patients take them to, you know, boxing gyms and boxing really helped them. Um, but as a, a former uh, Dean at the, the University of California, San Diego um, uncovered something interesting there. Intercollegiate sports is demanding. It takes a lot of time. You know, our student athletes spend a lot of time. And UC San Diego, very rigorous school, tough academics. The athletes had higher GPAs than the, the rest of the student body. So, it's a, well, they, but they took all this time out. And then a lot of them also had to have a part-time job to help them pay for a school. So they had a part-time job, intercollegiate athletics, and they were doing better academically than the general population. General population sounds like a prison. Uh, the student body, I should say. Um, so um, yeah, the, a lot of that, that mind-body connection. And then the third thing is about mission. Um, I just really liked your book, Anne, and that thought about mission. And I know um, we celebrated 10 years uh, at Indie Books and we accomplished the mission we'd set out to do. And it was a big, hairy, audacious goal. And we were going to create this business like no other. And there's you know, no other publishing company, no other marketing agency. Nobody was going to be like us. And, you know, I think we said, and if we could publish 100 books, wouldn't that be amazing? And we're at 170 books, but probably we in the publishing industry, when you do an ebook or when you do an audible book or a hardback book, those are separate titles. So we're over 500 titles, which is amazing. Yeah. But it required um, Devin and I stepping back and saying, we need a new mission. We need a new mission for the next 10 years. What is the mission for the next 10 years? And I have found it very energizing. 
and you know to the point about being in the now but being in the long term and that, that balance but sometimes in the now i just say okay this is like building a cathedral out of a million bricks just what bricks could i use do today you know what what few bricks could i add to the cathedral today um and that's that's empowering so um the world needs your book and they need to hear about you um are, is there any other final question before we uh antonio great tell us and tell us the title of the book you're working on yes uh, my book uh, is called <laughs> i forgot <laughs> i have to think for, for a second <laughs> Oh, it is, oh no, uh, you're you're not different than the rest of us, Antonio. <laughs> the name of my book is uh, yeah. Sorry to put you on the spot like no, that. No, no, it, it is uh, empower your presentation skills. That's there that's you the go. Empower your idea. presentation skills. Presentation Thank skills, you. yes. And uh, I have a, maybe a similar story as you. I I had not thought about ever writing a book, but then I gave a workshop on speaking skills. And I came up with a, a step, uh, with a, a process consisting of 10 steps. And then when I met Henry at uh, one of the seminars with Darren LaCroix, uh, you know, I said, well, what type of a book would I write? What type of a book would I write? You know, that's it. You know, that that's something different at least. So that 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 is my question. When you began your book, uh, what... Are there any specific guidelines that you use to be different from what? Because there are many, many books on leadership. And, and that's the same thing that happened to me. You know, there's many, many uh, books about speaking skills and presentation skills. Yeah, Antonio, I, uh, you're asking me, right? I just want to make sure yeah. I'm clear. Yes, okay. I'm, so yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Words. I'm um, sorry. I didn't say no, that. No, 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 that's okay. Um, you know, it is a concern. I mean, you know, the leadership, you know, book space is just overflowing, right? I, the day that I put a LinkedIn picture of me opening my box of books, two of my colleagues had the same picture on their on their LinkedIn. Tells you how many people are writing books, right? Around right. all in the leadership. Three million a year. Three million a year. Um, and so... Right. Like, what are you going, what have you done for me lately? Right. Which is part of Henry's point is like leadership stuff is gets old. You got to write something new because the, the, the space is always evolving. But because I had this particular bent on it using the principles of endurance athletics, I did know, and I did, I, one of the things, you know, I did a pretty, um, comprehensive, you know, market analysis of what was out there in that space. And there's not a lot in the things that are written are generally people's own lived experiences. So they're like, you know, here's how I was an endurance athlete. And here's how you can apply that to leadership when they're not necessarily leaders. Um, having that junction made sense. And the other thing is that none of the authors are women. And so that in and of itself is a distinction for me. Right. Um, right. Yeah. They're all males. Um, and so it's, for me, the, the writing process was really different. It's interesting that you put these 10 steps together. I, I had to go to a very specific analytical breakdown where I put every chapter up and I looked at how many hours it would take me to write a chapter and I had to map them all out on my board. And as soon as I did that, I, I kind of was able to yeah. all just started writing it. It was like, okay, well, I can do two hours today and three hours tomorrow and really made sense of it that way. But I, I do think that there's that it's like, what makes this unique? Like, what are you offering to the, to the world with this? That's unique. And my guess is there is some aspect of your book that's going to be unique. And it's like, what is that? Right. And being able to make sure that that's front and center. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, for what you have who came from Mexico and thinks in English and Spanish. There are two tunes playing in his head at all times. <laughs> that sounds confusing. Speaking yeah. of the tunes in people's heads, there was something he, earlier you said, Anne, about, and then Fran commented on it, about you know the, this notion, and I'll call it the notion of wanting to write a book. 
And somebody interviewed me once and said, well, why did you want to write this book? And I said, I didn't want to write this book. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I had to write this book because it was in my head. I had to get it out. And that's for 17 books. I had to get it out of my head so I could move on uh, with my life. So that that's a common theme said different ways by many of the authors that we've worked with that, um, you know, they felt. And Antonio, I think the same thing with you and my working with you is that you got to get this out of you. Um, and then and then comes the hard work. The sloppy first copies, the easy work. Right. The hard work is in the editing and the first draft and the second draft. But the sloppy first copy is like, blah, here it is. Um, you know, this is what I'm thinking. And then feedback and refining. And but the, the world needs to hear you. They need to hear your stories, not just Antonio's and Anne's, but all of our authors. We say your your stories matter. Yeah. Um, and it's what makes your book unique. So Antonio, yes. these stories about people you've trained, that makes this different yeah. than any other book. Right. right and yeah. oh, and that thing about you know, um my my Warren Buffett book. We found that there were countless books on Warren Buffett, the investor, and no books on Warren Buffett, the deal maker. How he convinced people to sell their companies to him for eighty percent of what other people were offering. You know what was the story behind that, which we researched and presented. So you also find out that you know what is it that the world hasn't heard? Gee, this thing about no none by women. Um, is not surprising and thank you for helping to change that in our lifetime yeah thank you right right yeah. and this is gonna yeah. sound like a plug but i don't i don't mean it to but i just want to emphasize antonio for you like i did a lot of research and made some missteps before i got to indie books and yeah. uh, you know there's so many people out there that are more than willing to get your book published or um, you know, provide you with all the marketing to get your book to be an Amazon bestseller, right? Like all these gimmicky things that are out there. And, um, and I actually had like purchased one that I never really used. It got, I wrote the book. That was the, that was all it really got me to do. But what I loved right. about, you know, this process, not only was it that you really get carried wealth with an entire team who knows your content from like soup to nuts, right? Like right. from the top, from the sloppy first copy all the way through your marketing journey. But also the fact that the first thing Henry ever said was that this is a family. And for me, right. that was a really important distinction. Like this isn't about just transaction. This is about a community of people who are here mm -hmm. to help each other. And, um, and, you know, I don't, there's lots of parts of making a book successful and marketing it that are important, but having a team of people who are helping you and guiding you and providing you with pithy insights or, or quotable quips uh, is always great. So I, yeah, I do, yeah. it made a huge difference for me in in how I was able to get through the process. Right. Yeah. Well, that's I, I'm experiencing that as well. Yeah. But I guess that uh, that helps a lot. And and your answers regarding. You know how you get to this process really, really helped me. So I, I thank you very much for that, and definitely I wish you lots of success. And like every family, there's some positives and negatives. <laughs> so one of ours is, uh, you know, may I give pushback because I care? So those frank family discussions we have sometimes. Um, but what is Devin? What do you say about a family? We love all of our family, but there are definitely some characters, you know, a crazy uncle or two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Devin yeah. had this insight the other day. We were having dinner and talking about it. And she said, you know, they say autism's on the rise and more people on the spectrum. She goes, you know, everybody used to have this crazy weird uncle, you know, this uh, off the ground. This is, I just don't think they were diagnosed, uh, <laughs> but they were there. Probably, yeah.
Yes. A lot of weird uncles. <laughs> I know I have them. I know I am one. So there you go. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Um, and uh, Anne, wish you the best success and look forward Thank to having you. you on Agency Rainmaker TV and back at our forum speaking. Um, Great. It's always a delight to have you here, Anne. Thank you. So, it's a delight uh, to be here. We do this every month. Uh, it's a community. And uh, if you're an author, uh, we invite you to come along and ask your questions and uh, even tell us a little bit about your book. Um, and definitely the Indie Books family. We love to see you here, too. So thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Thank you.